Good afternoon, everyone. The Senate Energy, Utilities, Environment, and Climate Committee will come to order. It's Monday, February 27th, 2023, 1230. We're in room 1150 of the Minnesota Senate building, and we note for the record that a quorum is present. Good to see you back, members. Our first bill would be uh, Senator Murphy, Senate File 1778. Senator Murphy, welcome to the committee. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. There would be no mistaking in the record where we are and what time it is in the day. I appreciate that. Thanks, Senator. You're welcome. Um, please uh, present Senate file 1778 if you got it in the shape you need it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senate file uh, 1778 is a proposal uh, that is uh, the result of a, a, an ongoing conversation among entities uh, in, about a development in the project or in the district that I represent, and I do have an author's amendment. All right, Senator Murphy has an author's amendment, and that is the A1 amendment, Senator. That is right, Mr. Chair and members. Do you want to describe it? So the A1 amendment uh, essentially takes what is the idea of the bill as introduced and creates a process um, so that we understand uh, how this is going to work. So we took a good idea um, but put some bones to it so that um, as we're moving this through the process, we understand what we're trying to achieve and how we're going to achieve that. And I would appreciate your support. All right. Thank you, Senator Murphy. To the A1 amendment, Senator Klein. Mr. Chair, I move the A1 amendment. All right, Senator Klein moves the A1. Members, any further discussion on the A1 author's amendment? Seeing none, all in favor of the A1 amendment, please say aye. aye. All opposed? All right, the A1 is adopted. Senator Murphy to the bill as amended. Thank you, Senator Frentz and members. Uh, I am really happy to carry this piece of legislation um, that is uh, the result of an ongoing conversation in the district I represent. Uh, as you know, the Ford plant in St. Paul has been decommissioned and taken apart. Uh, there is a new development, which is very exciting um, in St. Paul uh, in terms of uh, all the things you would imagine, including the new ideas that we can build in the infrastructure. Um, colleagues of ours, uh, friends of mine, or a constituent of mine uh, from the Friends of the Mississippi uh, has been working to make sure that we understand if there is contamination at this site. Um, and that process is ongoing. And at the same time, uh, the, the development is continuing, continuing and there's a desire to build a solar array. And we want to make sure if we find out that there was some contamination in the past um, that we're able to manage um, the solar array. Um, and so this bill seeks to create a contingency account so that there is funding to deal with that situation if it occurs. I am here today with Mr. Pearson. He is an expert on this issue and I would love to turn this over to him. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Mr. Pearson, could you please introduce yourself and then present your testimony to Senate File 1778? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Jim Pearson. I'm with Excel Energy, and I wanted to thank Senator Murphy uh, for carrying the bill. Um, this has been a, a project that Excel Energy has been involved in for a number of years. Um, the, the redevelopment of the uh, former Twin Cities Twin, uh, assembly plant there in, in Highland Park is a, is a really unique project. And so we have been working with, the, with Ryan Companies, who's the master developer, as well as some of the other developers to try to uh, enable them to meet some of the sustainability goals that have been established for the site. Uh, this particular discussion around Area C and solar uh, has been one that has been a complicated one. It's been one that we've been working on and try to bring some creative ideas forward. And again, I think that's, uh, Senator Murphy did a great job explaining the bill, uh, and it does represent that balance between some of the community interests uh, moving forward on renewable energy, but also understanding that Area C solar, or Area C, the property itself, has a uh, interesting past, and uh, the MPCA has been involved in the site for uh, several decades. Um, and as that work continues, uh, we are just trying to find a way to balance um, to make sure that if a solar array is constructed, that it will not be an impediment to any future cleanup. Um, one point I'd like to make, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, is uh, we appreciate uh, your time in hearing the bill. We're hopeful that it will be uh, part of a future bill as things move forward. 
Um, but I want to be clear, uh, if the bill is included and passes, this allows us to move forward, but it does not green light the project. Uh, we still have to go to the Public Utilities Commission, uh, seek approval for the project. Again, we would not be the owner of the solar array. Uh, XL Energy would be the off-taker of the energy. So anytime we uh, propose to enter into a power purchase agreement with a third party, we need to seek commission approval. That process still lays ahead. So again, uh, glad to talk as much detail uh, as members would wish. Um, there is a long history here and happy to answer any questions I can. Thank you again, Mr. Pearson. Thanks, Senator Murphy, for the nuance on ownership. Members, any questions for the author or the testifier on Senate File 1778? I see Senator Rarick. Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, this is something I know we've talked about in the past, and I believe Senator Senjum uh, had worked with you on in the past as well. Um, I am a supportive of it. Um, we do have an A3 amendment that I would like to offer, if our staff has it for... Okay, staff will pass out the A3 amendment, and while they're passing it out, Senator Rarick, if you'd like to give a description of the A3 amendment. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I did speak with uh, the author of the bill and Mr. Pearson uh, right before committee started. This is a, an amendment that would require a report back to the legislature on, on how things are moving along with the, with the project and the funds. So um, we did speak about the date and stuff, but I'll let them kind of speak to some of the things they see in the amendment. But, so thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you, Senator Rarick. Um, Senator Murphy to the A3 amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Rarick and members. Uh, first of all, I really do appreciate getting the amendment ahead of time so we get a chance to look at it and to talk about it together. Uh, we agree in spirit with the notion that there should be a report. Um, the, the 25th, the, the 2025 date um, probably predates um, the erection of the array itself, so we have some issues with the val maybe the perhaps the number of reports or the date um, and if it's okay with you we would love to work with you to make sure if this bill proceeds um, that it proceeds in a way that is workable um, understanding that this is a good idea but not quite right in this form thank you senator murphy senator rarick uh, thank you mr chair and, and i appreciate that and uh, i will uh, continue to work with the author and uh, with mr pearson to get the dates right and and maybe the number of reports and when they would be done so um, with that, I will withdraw the A3 amendment. Thank you, Senator Rarick. The A3 amendment is withdrawn. Member questions, Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would like to offer the A4 amendment. Senator Green offers the A4 amendment. Staff will distribute the amendment. And while we're distributing it, Senator Green, do you mind uh, addressing the amendment and give us a little explanation, please? Certainly. Um, I've been learning more and more about solar panels and we have a lot of talk about PFAS. And solar panels are uh, uh, coated with PFAS. And I don't think we've done any studies on uh, how much of that is gonna be running off into the, the areas um, where these things have been placed. And the A4 amendment just simply says that we can't uh, put, the, put the solar panels uh, when they're recycled, they have to be recycled and they can't be placed in landfills. And it's because we're going to, if, if we're truly concerned about the PFAS, we shouldn't be adding more to it. Thank you, Senator Green. Senator Murphy to the A4 amendment, Thanks. or perhaps Mr. Person. Thanks, Senator Prince. We're just taking a look at it. All taking right. a look at it. Take your time. Thank you, Senator Prince. Um, miss, Mr. Chair and Mr. Senator Pearson. Green, um, so this issue uh, around panel recycling is, uh, is also an important one. Um, as I, I would... I would welcome the opportunity to continue to try to talk about how best to do this. Uh, in reading it, um, I'd like to have a little time to kind of think through. So from, from XL Energy's perspective as the off-taker of the energy, um, we wouldn't have uh, a role in the decommissioning of the site. Uh, that would be done by the owner of the site, which is a, a third party. Um, so obviously, if it's a site that we own, we're under um, Public Utility Commission oversight to make sure that any any panels or waste is dealt with appropriately. Um, so I, I'd like the chance to kind of work with you, Senator Green, and, and the other members of the committee to see how we can, um, in, again, incorporate this idea. I think you've hit on a really important one. Um, I just, I think the language, because of 
the parties and how they're regulated may need a little massaging to, to really get to what, what you're hoping to accomplish. So um, again, my just quickly looking at it, I'd be a little concerned about just the language as, as, as indicated, but I, I certainly understand the point and I think there's a way to probably get there. Thank you, Mr. Pearson. Uh, Senator Green, we're gonna go to Senator Mitchell. Senator Mitchell. Um, yes, I would like to um, speak against this because the fact is that PFAS isn't customarily used in solar panels because we've already found safer, effective alternatives. Um, and so that is what is typically used now. Um, so I, I think we're finding a solution to a problem that actually doesn't exist. And therefore, um, I personally do not see the need for the Air 4 amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Members, other questions regarding the A4 amendment? Seeing none, uh, Senator Green, any final comments uh, to the A4? Yeah, I have, I've seen the, that they're, they are making progress, but the PFAS has not been eliminated. And we're spending a lot of money in trying to clean up PFAS. And I think that if this, uh, as this bill moves forward, I think we would be better addressed uh, Better, better able to address this if this was in the bill and worked toward that goal rather than put it off to the side and maybe it disappears later on down the line and we're stuck with something that we didn't intend that could potentially be harmful. So I would like to uh, ask for a roll call vote on the amendment. Thank you very much. Senator Green requests a roll call. A roll call vote will be granted. Uh, final comments to the amendment, Senator Murphy. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, and Senator Green, I appreciate what uh, is before us. Um, hadn't seen it ahead of time. So uh, for that reason, I do uh, ask and invite uh, the committee to work with us on this language rather than adopt it today. One of the reasons why we are here um, is because of a concern about contamination at this site um, and because of the industry, right? And I grew up in an in a automobile manufacturing community and I understand um, that there are concerns about that. The community interests in the district I represent, those that are concerned about the state of the water, um, the Mississippi River, um, they wanna make sure that that is being tended to and that if we find something that we're able to uh, account for it and repair that. Um, in, at the same time, the community I represent is very, very interested in new and green energy and they, they would like to see um, the infrastructure of this development reflect today and our future. So we have community interests that are working together, um, given those that past and our future, and I think that this is a good idea that is a part of that, but we need to work on the amendment a little bit. So again, Mr. Chair, I would appreciate a no vote on the amendment with my commitment to work with you. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Senator Klein, did you have a comment on the A4? Yeah, and my regrets for coming after the chief author, and you can certainly go back to them uh, if needed after my comments. But um, one of the, uh, perhaps, you know, it's uh, unfortunate to get what's probably good ideas in amendment form uh, with no advance notice to sort of consider it and, and try to implement it as part of the bill. And one of the unintended consequences of, I think, the language in front of us is in the last sentence, which would impact my district, solar energy generating systems, and associated infrastructure may not be placed in a land disposal facility. We have several closed landfills in my district, um, and that's empty land that can be used very effectively to place solar panels and generate solar energy on those facilities. As I understand the A4, it would preclude my community from, from doing that going forward. So that'll be the reason for my no vote on the amendment. Thank you, Senator Klein. Members, we are on the A4 amendment. A roll call has been requested, a roll call granted. Senator Murphy, can I assume you don't have any further comments to the amendment with that? Uh, members, the clerk will take the roll. Senator Friend? No. Senator Zhang? No. Senator Matthews? Yes. Senator Dibble? No. Senator Green? Yes. Senator Grunhagen? Yes. Senator Hoffman? Senator Klein? No. Senator Lucero? Yes. Senator McEwen? No. Senator Mitchell? No. Senator Port? No. Senator Rarick? Yes. Senator Weber? Yes. Senator Hoffman?
Members, there being six yes votes on the amendment and so seven no votes, the amendment is not adopted. Members, other questions to the underlying bill? Comments? Seeing none, uh, we'll give final comments to the chief author, Senator Murphy. Uh, Madam, uh, Mr. Chair and members, I'm really grateful that you're giving this proposal its due attention in the Senate and I'm thankful uh, for your time and your attention. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Uh, members, it's our intention to lay this bill over for possible inclusion in the RDA portion, and to that point, Senator Green, of course, you have an opportunity to continue to work on the A4 amendment and the contents therein. Seeing no further, uh, the bill is laid over. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. With that, members, Senator Dibble is here to present Senate File 1783. And while we're setting up Senator Dibble, let me say thank you to Emanuel Lutheran School and all the students for stopping by from beautiful Cortland, Minnesota. Have a good day, kids. <laughs> Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair uh, and committee for the opportunity to present Senate File 1783. Uh, thank you as well to my co-author, Senator Rarick, uh, Senator Kupik, Senator McEwen, and Senator Hoffman. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, uh, what this bill would do is it would provide additional support for the clean energy resource teams, which we know colloquially as colloquially, I can't say that word, <laughs> we know as certs, uh, uh, who work across the state. They um, act as navigators and they connect people to resources and information and opportunities that they need to advance energy efficiency. Uh, renewable energy projects, those sorts of things. Currently, uh, Mr. Chair, members, uh, we do support their work with 500,000 per year from the Conservation Improvement Program, the, the SIP fund, uh, their re research and development uh, part of that fund, which we passed a number of years ago, which I was the chief author of uh, many years ago now. Uh, and this funding hasn't changed since 2011. So this new appropriation would allocate an additional $500,000 per year, a million over the biennium from the general fund, to provide additional capacity, uh, if you look to the bill itself, to provide additional capacity to perform the duties which are spelled out in statute. And if you're really curious, uh, the search statute is 216C.385. Um, and it would allow this organization to staff full-time positions all across Minnesota. Uh, it has six regions in greater Minnesota, as well as additional capacity in the metro. And this is important because we really do need to fully support this statewide staff team so that they can do all the things that I've just described. They're seeing increasing requests for educational resources, this navigation assistance, uh, and we know, of course, Mr. Chair, there are many opportunities, as we've heard about, uh, a lot uh, from um, the bill that, that you recently presented, um, energy efficiency, beneficial electrification, renewables, um, and it's really hard to just go out there and figure it out yourself. I've tried. There's a lot of websites with a lot of information collating and synthesizing and figuring out where to go um, to find the resources, to find um, the information, to find the technical support, the contractors, et cetera, um, it's just really, really hard. So an organization like CERTS um, can really respond to communities, meet, where, meet them where they're at. Um, so Ms. Uh, Senator Frentz and members, we do have um, the CERTS ladies with us, <laughs> Lisa Polish and Diana McEwen, um, who know a lot about this work because they've been heading it up for a really long time, if they could share some thoughts. Thank you very much, Senator Dibble. Uh, members, we're going to take testimony now. Senator Dibble, uh, do you have someone who you prefer to testify next? I'm Lisa Polish. Nice to see Chair you, Ms. Friends. Polish. Nice uh, to see you. Welcome to the committee. Thank Having you. already introduced yourself, please present your testimony. Fantastic. Um, is it possible for me to, sh can you all see this right now on your computer screens? No, but our pages are expert at getting that set up. Fantastic. Look see, at that. That only took wow. two seconds. That's that was, kind of committee we run here. <laughs> yeah, it's light speed. Um, good afternoon. My name is Lisa Polish. Um, I serve as the search director. Uh, and I'm based at the University of Minnesota Extension's Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships. 
I get that lucky title that I get to say all of the time. Um, CERTS is a partnership, so I'm based at the university. Diana is based at the Great Plains Institute, Southwest Regional Development Commission. Our colleague Jay Trusty is joining us remotely. And the Minnesota Department of Commerce are the four partners that make up CERTS. And actually, you have in your packets a little fact sheet that describes that. You can see the logos across the bottom. Um, we come together to advance CERTS's mission, which is to connect individuals and their communities to the resources that they need to both identify and then importantly, implement community-based clean energy projects. We work across the state. We have staff and steering committee members in seven regions across the state. And though those regional staff are part-time across greater Minnesota, we accomplish a lot. And one of the other pieces that we have is a 2022 annual report highlights and accomplishments summary. This is a distilled version of the 15 page report that we submit to the Minnesota Department of Commerce that then comes as part of the Conservation Improvement Program Research and Development Funds report to the legislature. So every year we provide a report to the legislature annually. In addition to our staff, we have steering committees and I believe in your packet there was a handout that listed out all of the steering committee members. I suspect that many of you will recognize names of the folks in your areas. You can see that they include small business owners and individuals, local government staff, and a common denominator across all of our steering committees is that they include utility representatives. We are not policy folks. We really focus on that implementation and support. We are not trying to drive people to do something, rather we're trying to support them as they decide they would like to do something to help them do it more efficiently, effectively, and simply. We provide tools and guides and decision tools and model documents and model RFPs. We provide direct technical assistance to folks who want to pursue a project, so they're embarking on their first energy efficiency effort. They're trying to navigate, what does this contract mean and what do I do with it? We're there to help support them through that process. We also convene peer networks and we provide lots of opportunities to get out into the community and share with folks the stuff and resources that we know. So you can see on this slide, this is an example of a page that we developed about the Inflation Reduction Act. Last fall, just as the act was coming out, we were starting to get a lot of questions. We worked to distill it down to very simple residents and heat pumps. So if you're a resident interested in a heat pump, that's the section you look at. We update that web page every time the IRS makes changes, so about weekly. We've actually started giving lots of presentations about the IRA and chair friends. Actually, our very first presentation was with the South Central Minnesota Clean Energy Council in Mankato, and they recorded it. Um, and now we get lots of other requests for presentations, so we're embarking this week on doing a train the trainer for other groups to be able to give presentations of their own. Um, also noted on here, we provide seed grant funding and we do a lot of storytelling. So if you take a quick look at this map, I suspect that you will recognize some of the dots from places near you. We have provided funding to nearly 470 seed grants since we started doing seed grants in 2006. Um, just last year, you can see on the back of your handout a quick summary of the 74 seed grants that were awarded. This was our largest year of funding yet. And as just a quick example of one seed grant, uh, a project that we funded last year was with Eighth Fire Solar based on White Earth. They do solar thermal hot air systems. That's that little black box that you see going up on the side of a house. This is a different kind of solar than much of the solar you've been discussing, but it allows folks to preheat the air coming into their home and decrease their home heating bills. Eighth Fire went and trained and installed um, these systems on Lower Sioux um, Indian community members' homes and trained some of the Lower Sioux members on doing that project. We've since had knock-on benefits of doing a, a residential heating study with Lower Sioux to look at residential heating options and to do training with the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. And with that, Diana. Thank you very much. Uh, if you could please introduce yourself to the committee and then present your testimony. Welcome to Energy. Thank you, Chair, friends, and Senators. And my name is Diana McEwen, and I direct the Metro Region of CERTS at the Great Plains Institute, one of the four partners. Um, so this slide will show kind of a sampling of the work we do. Um, our work is really wide ranging and, and really focuses on clean energy deployment. That's our focus. Um, these snapshots will give you kind of a quick glimpse at our efforts. 
We host a really, really popular clean energy job board. I'm pretty sure that's the most popular thing on our website. Um, we provide technical assistance to schools as part of the Solar for Schools um, program. We host EV ride and drives uh, across the state. Um, we've conducted um, manufactured home park energy efficiency blitzes all over. Um, and we work just overall to reduce energy burden um, for households. Um, next slide. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Um, CERT's uh, manufactured home park work is actually award-winning um, and has garnered national attention, including from the Weather, the weather um, Channel. Um, more importantly, though, it's really helped um, families with that often tricky to um, deal with housing stock, like manufactured homes, to save energy and money. Um, pictured here are some of our partners at Growing Up Healthy in Rice County um, for a project that we did there. CERTS has developed numerous resources, um, including online videos and programming to partner with our manufactured home parks and their residents and utilities across the state. So we've been working really closely, like for example, with Minnesota um, Energy Resources. Um, so these are the, um, the home energy guides. Um, and so we have um, put these together. Um, there are four different kinds, so they focus on different uh, entities, so single family, manufactured homes, renters, landlords, and we have them in multiple languages. Um, the other thing that's really cool about these is that they're customizable, so a community group or a utility or even a landlord could put their logo on and distribute it um, for some co-branding or for some familiarity um, with their community. Um, and next is the air source heat pumps uh, are all the rage, um, <laughs> if you know that. Um, we have oodles of resources um, for folks that are trying to figure out if a heat pump is right for their home. Um, and beyond the guide, we have stories of families that own a heat pump. Um, and we just recently launched Ask Alexis, um, a, a, a column, a device column from our um, colleague Alexis. Um, like the energy guides, um, this is also um, the heat pump um, uh, document is customizable and a number of utilities have also used that um, and taken advantage of that resource to provide some information to their members. Um, so we have a receive, we see lots and lots of questions and requests from farmers and small um, rural businesses, small businesses, uh, both for energy efficiency and renewable energy. Uh, for example, we've been doing a lot of work in the rural grocery space, helping connect those businesses to both energy assessments and financing for some of those cooler upgrades. Um, one example is Aaron's Grocery Store in Fertile, Minnesota. Um, beyond efficiency, we also do custom project assistance um, and have tools to help those that are interested in pursuing renewable energy projects. Through our Renewable Energy for Greater Minnesota programs, um, CERTS has helped explore projects that would work for farms or businesses and ident identify potential funding and financing options like the USDA REAP program and PACE um, financing to pr and provide one-on-one -on -one assistance to really help folks move their projects along. Um, finally, um, we've done a lot of work um, with cities and municipal utilities, um, really helping prepare communities for vehicle electrification. Um, we have hosted several cohorts um, of communities coming together and helping support them at getting the information they need to make decisions for their community around that charging infrastructure or purchasing electric vehicles for their fleets. We do this across the state, um, and just like our manufactured home park work, um, we do peer-to-peer -peer sessions, often with utilities. We hosted one in November um, that was focused on electric vehicles, and we had a panel that included um, folks from uh, East Central Electric, Right Hennepin Electric, and Elk River Municipal Utilities. We have focused a number of efforts in Greater Minnesota, including um, this event um, called Northern Exposure that we partnered with several utilities and car dealerships, um, and it was a ride and drive in Roseau, Minnesota, the first time we had done one up in Northwest Minnesota. Minn Kota played a really key role with that. So with that, we just want to really thank you for the opportunity to share more about CERTS. Um, we have worked really hard over the past 20 years to help communities advance their own community scale projects. And with additional support, we hope to be able to scale up and support even more communities as they work to capture these newly available resources and incentives and advance their own community place-based clean energy projects. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Ms. Polish. Thanks, Ms. McKeon. We show two other witnesses on the testifying list. Is Ms. Kuiper here? Ms. Kuiper, uh, please come forward and present your testimony. Thank Welcome you, to Chair, the friends, and committee. My name is Annette Kuiper. I'm the Community Relations and Beneficial Electrification Director for Wright Hennepin Cooperative Electric Association. 
Wright Hennepin is a member-owned, not-for-profit electric utility that provides power to more than 58,000 electric accounts in rural Wright County and Western Hennepin County. I'm here today in support of the appropriation for the Clean Energy Resource Team, or CERTS. We find the CERTS resources valuable in our mission to provide clean, affordable, and reliable energy to our membership. As a newly elected member to the CERTS Metro Steering Committee, I have witnessed their valuable work in connecting communities to renewable energy options and providing clean energy education. This has shown in our right Hennepin service area in three ways. First, as you've heard, the CERTS website has many resources available to our members, including home energy saving guides and the latest updates on clean energy incentives. The CERTS member, Great Plains Institute, provides staff to coordinate our annual electric vehicle ride and drive events, and this allows our members to try out electric vehicles. Secondly, the CERTS team lends technical expertise to our efforts to leverage state and federal funding to build out our electric grid to accommodate for the growth of electric vehicles. Obtaining this funding will allow us to directly save dollars for our entire member service area. Lastly, the CERTS team unites Wright Hennepin with partners to synchronize clean energy efforts. In November, as you heard Diana mentioned, they convened the peer-to-peer -peer webinar to bring together utilities to share information related to EV charging infrastructure and auto dealer engagement. Our Chief Operating Officer, Wendy Youngren, joined other experts across the state to share EV initiatives and enable all of us to share our best practices. This additional funding will allow CERTs to increase staffing to provide these necessary resources for Wright Hennepin to benefit all our members, and we encourage all of you to support this bill. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ms. Kuyper. Uh, members, we have an online testifier and I believe we have a J trustee from Southwest Regional Development Commission. Mr. Trustee, are you there? And if so, can you hear us? Uh, I can hear you, Chair Friends. Thank you. Mr. Trustee, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Friends. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> Senators and distinguished guests, I'm Jay Trustee, Executive Director of the Southwest Regional Development Commission in Slayton. We cover the nine counties in the far southwest corner of Minnesota and serve the nine counties, 80 cities, 162 townships, and parts of 32 school districts. We are a partner in the clean energy resource teams, and they have been very important in helping us integrate clean energy planning into our local and regional planning efforts. As I'm sure you are aware, Southwest Minnesota has been a leader in renewable energy development since the 1990s, and CERTS helps us broaden the impact of that development. To me, one of the greatest things about CERTS is the ability to share and partner on programs such as our Commercial Property Assessed Clean Energy or PACE program. Our program came together through a partnership between the Southwest Regional Development Commission, the Rural Minnesota Energy Board, Lion Link and Electric Co-op, the Reed Fund from East River Energy, and the Minnesota Department of Commerce, also one of the CERTS partners. Our first project was the Blue Line Truck Stop in Worthington, the project was the replacement of all of the exterior lighting with LEDs. Uh, the project saved the owners over $14,000 a year in electricity costs. After their loan payment was made, they were able to put over $5,000 a year back into their business. It was so successful that they later returned to the program for a second time to upgrade their interior lighting and coolers. These sorts of programs that develop out of the partnerships that CERTS promotes are invaluable in their ability to provide technical assistance to our constituents across jurisdictional boundaries. I thank the committee and urge your support. Thank you, Mr. Trustee. Um, anyone in the public who did not sign up to testify who would like to be heard on the bill? Seeing none, no one else online. Members, any questions for Senator Dibble to the bill? Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This might be for both uh, Senator Dibble and also, uh, I think it was Pollock, is it? 
polish, like shoe polish. polish. Okay, Miss Polish. Okay, uh, I got a couple of questions. The, the one when you were talking about the panels on the on the walls, the solar panels on the walls that actually put uh, forced air. I, I, if I'm if I'm uh, if I'm recognizing these, there's just like a four inch hole you cut in your wall. There's a little fan on it, and it actually blows heat in. Is this what I'm talking about? Yes. Sir. Okay. Uh, they, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but this was tried in the 70s, and it was not a very big success. And one of the reasons was that uh, when the sun wasn't shining, it was uh, um, a four-inch hole in your wall that was putting cold air into your house. And also, if the panel was not covered, and sometimes even if it was, in the summertime, uh, the quality at that time was such that they deteriorated within a few years. And the whole thing was kind of a big boondoggle. Uh, what kind of upgrades have been made on these panels to prevent that? Ms. Polish. Senator Friends, Senator Green. Thanks so much for the question. I would actually love to follow up directly with the 8th Fire folks to get you more specific information. And I will add, um, the Rural Renewable Energy Alliance, which was based in Pine River, um, understood all of the things that you were describing from the 1970s when they began a whole process to go through manufacturing of this new system. They owned the project for about 10 years, the manufacturing facility, and then transferred ownership to 8th Fire and have been going through lots of testing to make sure that it is certified. They, they initially, when they first started back in the early, to, um, like 2002-ish, had been looking at old panels and found some of the same things that you're describing. And there, we are actually working with 8th Fire right now to do some studies that would actually do measurement within homes to look at temperatures, measure air flows, and make sure that all of that is up to snuff. But this was a program that was actually had some rebate funding years ago, and they've been looking at these very things. I mean, weatherization is an important component of getting these homes ready for these systems, and obviously with weatherization, you're trying to do all of that air sealing and insulation first, you know, make sure that you don't have leaks, and that is essential. But let me do some follow-up with you if that would be okay to make sure I get you good information. Thanks, Ms. Polish. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'd like that follow-up. That would be great uh, because it doesn't seem like, it sounds like you're still kind of studying it. But uh, the other issue is that if, if I'm reading this right and I try to do a, a little bit of background on this, you're actually doubling the amount uh, into this program. And from what I'm understanding, uh, the extra half a million dollars that you're asking for is only for new FTEs, and it sounds like six. Uh, so how many are there now, and are, is any of this money going for projects, or is it all for uh, new staff? Senator Green, can I assume that's a question for the author? Yes, you can. Okay. Thank you, Senator. Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I would uh, um, mention that um, this would be uh, the first increase in support for this work um, since 2011. And the demand for the, the time and attention from the CERTS teams um, has increased quite a bit uh, since that time. So not only, you know, have they lost ground relative to inflation since 2011, um, so that 500000 is worth a lot less than it was all those years ago, um, but uh, their, their volume of work has, has increased quite a bit as, as we've brought on. Um, you know, quite a bit of new technology and quite a bit new effort uh, around conservation efficiency as well as renewable energy. And um, yeah, this, these dollars um, by and large won't go for uh, capital assets or for grants. It'll be for the infrastructure, the support, the staffing, the, you know, providing all of the things that were presented, you know, in terms of the convening, the information, the materials, the, um, you know, the communicating. So, um, uh, you know, when you're talking about $500,000, um, that pays for a part of a staff person. It's, it's, you know, I, I'm, I'm open to getting a lot more money so they could actually turn those dollars into uh, grants and, and uh, purchasing capital assets that they could put out into the field. But yeah, this is, uh, by and large, administrative support for their work. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Senator Green, by and large, administrative support. Senator Green. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. By and large, that's what I figured. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, the, the one question that wasn't answered, Senator Dibble, is, is you, I thought I heard you mention six new FTEs. How many are currently there uh, now within the, within the program? Senator Dibble. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I will ask either Ms. Polish, or I'll ask Ms. Polish. The, Ms. Polish. The to... Chair Friends, Senator Green, currently we have 15 folks working for CERT's 11 FTE, so this would be taking six part-time folks and making them full-time folks, as well as um, providing additional support. So Diana McEwen's time in the Metro isn't fully funded by this, this money. And the 11 FTE that we currently have is with us leveraging additional funding from the Department of Energy, the US Department of Agriculture, um, income and fees from some programs that we offer, and some philanthropic dollars. Thank you, Ms. Polish. Senator Green, any follow-up? Uh, thank you. One more, and then I'll be done. Um, it sounds to me like, uh, well, well, first of all, to comment that uh, I think a lot of the businesses and even the communities are aware of some of the new energy saving uh, products that we have out there now because uh, without having to have somebody come and tell them what they are. Uh, but at the same time, too, um, on the administrative costs here, um, and, and, the, and the increase in, in FTEs, um, I'm just not really, I'm not really seeing the need for this, this kind of an increase. And uh, the other, the question I guess for the author is, are the people that you're, that you're putting out in the field, but aside from being uh, people that come out and say, hey, you could put a light in here, are they helping write grants? Are they grant writers for these communities? Senator Dibble. Um, Mr. Chair, thank you for the question, um, Senator Green, and uh, you know I certainly respect your perspective that uh, people can find their own way and find their own resources. They can, sure, um, but uh, uh, you know I, I do think uh, the search teams, as as evidenced by um, the the testifiers, and I would refer everyone to um, the packet of of letters uh, and testimony uh, testifying to. Um, the kind of uh, practical uh, partnerships um, that the search teams develop, the kind of practical um, uh, support. Um, uh, you know, they, they are able to spend all of their time um, really focused on uh, finding the information, synthesizing it, uh, getting it out to people in ways that they can access and understand, um, either directly or through community partnerships with uh, on the ground existing organizations of all kinds, whether those are employers, faith communities, utilities, um, you know, you name it. Um, they're, they're finding folks to connect with to either provide the information on their own behalf or in partnership with CERTs. Um, and uh, I, I don't know if they assist with grant writing or not. Maybe Ms. Polish can, can help. Ms. Polish. Chair Friends, Senator Green. Uh, we don't do a lot of grant writing. We do a lot of support um, for farmers and rural small businesses on REAP applications. So we actually have templates that people can refer to about how to go through the process. There are examples that they can work through and we help with the pro formas and helping understand the savings. We also have model RFPs and th those kinds of things where we can support, say, a local government who's thinking about issuing an RFP for solar so that they can understand and navigate that process. We wouldn't issue the RFP, we wouldn't write it, but we have models and templates that they can use. So we do assist in those very tangible ways. Thank you, Ms. Polish. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Senator Green, any follow-up? All right. Uh, Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, um, you know, I, mm -hmm. I signed on as a co-author because um, he came uh, to talk to me about this and they talked about the project that uh, they've helped East Central Energy with uh, my rural electric co-op. Um, I did contact them and they did say they were uh, a very great uh, group to work with. They aided them quite a bit in that project. Um, so that's why I am a, a supporter uh, following my co-op's lead. Um, the question I have, um, again, is around the reporting and, and Ms. Polish, you mentioned uh, reporting. Can you uh, give us some details on what is reported uh, to the agency and then back to the legislature, please. Thank you, Senator Rarick. I believe that's for Ms. Polish. Ms. Polish. Chair Friends, Senator Rarick. Um, every year we write an annual report that details the activities that we conducted over the course of the year. Um, the funding as allocated right now, 
goes to the Minnesota Department of Commerce, and then the Minnesota Department of Commerce writes a grant to the University of Minnesota for the partners. So we have a very detailed work plan, um, and every year we report back on how we've done in terms of that work plan. We cover everything from the number of communities with whom we've partnered, amount of energy savings, um, the kinds of activities that we've performed. So this two-pager is really a distillation of all that is included. We also do lots of financial reporting as we go throughout the year um, we, because the university issues an invoice to the state and then those dollars come back. So all of that is included and part and parcel of that current annual report. Thank you, Ms. Paul. Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. One quick follow-up then. Um, with that, um, is there a breakout in that report on what was used for administration costs? Ms. Polish. Chair Friends and Senator Rarick, would you define for me what you mean by administrative costs, please? Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So like uh, salaries for uh, folks and then maybe any um, direct aid for their office work. Ms. Polish, Chair defined Friends, enough Senator for Senator Rarick, yes, thank you. Um, so in all of the invoices that get submitted from the University of Minnesota to the Minnesota Department of Commerce, all of that, yes, is explicitly spelled out. It names individual you know, staff <laughs> who charged as well as any you know, fringe, as well as all of our seed grants come through the current allocation. So that is detailed. Anything that we might have spent on you travel. Know, travel around the state to go to community meetings, all of that, yes, sir. Thanks, Ms. Polish. Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I did have a, an A1 amendment for uh, reporting, but it sounds like that is already being done, so there will be no need for the A1 amendment. All right, thank you, Senator Rarick. Members, any other comments, questions before we give the author of the bill the last word? Uh, members, it is our intention to lay this bill over for possible inclusion, seeing no hands. Senator Dibble, any final thoughts? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Uh, my only final thought, um, I mentioned kind of briefly in passing, but I really would um, encourage um, members to take a look at um, this packet of, of letters of support just to get a, a a gist of the breadth um, and scale and scope of the work that the CERT's organization does uh, through the six uh, uh, offices around the state. Um, it's uh, pretty compelling work, and I think um, we actually, it's a bargain. Um, I asked why they weren't asking for $2 million <laughs> per biennium, but um, they think they can make do with the uh, 500 and 500 per year request because, as Ms. Polish mentioned, um, that leverages quite a bit of other support through the work they're able to bill for and uh, private philanthropical support as well. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Uh, you're in here with substantial written support. You have bipartisan authorship. Uh, we're going to lay the bill over, but excellent job all around. And with that, members, Senate file 1783 is laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you again, Senator Dibble, and thank you, testifiers. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair you, and sir. members. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator. Committee. Members, the last bill on our agenda today is Senate File uh, 1003. Senator Coleman, I see Senator Coleman is here. Senator Coleman, welcome to the committee, Senator. Mr. O'Grady, while you are getting settled, members, the materials in your packet. Senator Coleman, welcome to the Senate Energy and Utilities Committee. Please uh, fire away. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do believe this is my first time before this committee, so thanks for having me and giving this bill a hearing. Uh, I do have an author's amendment to begin with, uh, the A-1 amendment. Senator Coleman offers the A-1 amendment. Senator Klein. Mr. Chair, I move the A-1. Senator Klein moves the A-1 amendment. Members, any discussion to the A-1? Senator Coleman, do you want to give us just a quick description of the A-1, please? Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Klein. Um, the A-1 amendment uh, reflects a little bit of feedback that we did get from the Homeowners Association and just trying to bring everyone to the table with some, some small changes to the bill. Thank you, Senator Coleman. Given that description, any members, any questions to the A-1? Hearing none, all in favor of adoption of the A-1, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? The A-1 is adopted. Senator Coleman, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, Senate File 1003 prohibits homeowners associations from outright bans on their residents installing rooftop solar panels. 
one in four Minnesotans, including many in my district, live in one of the state's more than 7,700 homeowners associations. And many of these Minnesotans want the opportunity to invest in their homes and lower their energy bills. 27 other states, including our neighbors in Iowa, Wisconsin, have laws that limit HOA restrictions on residential solar installations. Indiana and Ohio just passed laws in 2022. Under current Minnesota state law, however, HOAs can ban rooftop solar for no reason. This bill balances HOA homeowners' rights with the HOA association's duties. The bill allows HOAs to establish certain requirements, that it's done by a licensed contractor, that the panels don't extend beyond the peak or edge of the roof, the installer is reimbursed for damages, et cetera. Uh, the bill also requires uh, utilities to provide customers their data. Overall, I believe this is a common sense bill that allows homeowners to increase the economic use and value of their homes and make investments they want on their own their own properties. Uh, I am standing for any questions and uh, would greatly appreciate your support on this bill. Thank you very much, Senator Coleman. Members, before we go to testifiers, any questions for the author? Seeing none, um, I have Mr. O'Grady listed first on the list of testifiers. If you're okay with that, Senator, Mr. O'Grady, please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. For the record, my name is Logan O'Grady. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Solar Energy Industries Association. It's my first time here this session, so just a quick introduction. Mencia is a 501c6 trade organization. We're completely funded, driven, and directed by 140 member companies who employ over 5,000 Minnesotans throughout the state. They work in all areas of solar and energy storage deployment. Uh, what our job really is, is to create a stable, predictable marketplace for our companies to do business in, and part of that is removing barriers, which is what brings us here today. Obviously, if we are prohibited from doing business in specific communities, that's a significant barrier to overcome. So we really appreciate Senator Coleman's work on this bill. It's a bipartisan bill, and I think it's bipartisan because as Minnesotans, we really agree with the idea that people should be able to do whatever they want on their homes within reason, of course, um, and that especially if they're doing that, uh, making those investments and cutting their energy bills. Um, so uh, Senator Coleman did a great job walking through the bill, um, but I'm happy to uh, stay for any questions. I think this bill would mean a lot for the one in four Minnesotans that live in HOAs and who are uh, completely prohibited from making um, have, making a choice on the economic investments they're making in their own, own homes. So, thank you. Thanks, members. Um, any questions for Mr. O'Grady? Seeing none, I got one. Um, Senator Coleman, Mr. O'Grady, what's the percentage of the homeowners' contracts that ban solar currently, give or take? Are we talking 20%, 50%, 90%? Mr. O'Grady. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, I don't know for sure, um, but I do know that um, this bill doesn't completely prohibit them from denying an application, so it still leaves a process in place for all homeowners associations in the state to have that process. All right, thanks for that. <laughs> Members, see no questions. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam, or Mr. Chair. Uh, so as I'm thinking about this, uh, I do not know the, the extent of the types of materials that are used to install solar panels, et cetera, et cetera, but just in my mind's eye, I'm thinking about uh, many CICs uh, the, the units in there could be detached or they could be attached in either scenario. They're obviously paying into some kind of a common element that, they're, that expenses are used to, to draw from, such as cleaning of roofs, um, siding repair, cleaning of siding, et cetera, et cetera. And so in my mind's eye, I'm just thinking about the, the different roofs uh, that if they're north facing, for example, independent of solar panels, it is very common uh, on the, not just on the roofs, but on the, on the siding itself, to have different types of mold begin to form uh, or have discoloration on, on shingles. So I am trying to uh, envision then with the solar panels, are they going to create a scenario where there are shaded areas? Is it going to allow, and I generally don't know the answer to the question. Are they, and the question, by the way, Mr. Chair, is for anybody who wants to answer it. Uh, do solar panels, they're elevated from the roof, is there gonna be scenarios where there is discoloration or mold um, forming? Is, is, any materials that are used to attach them over time is rain gonna drip down as a discoloration in any capacity on the shingles, on the siding as the water's running down? And the reason I'm, I'm thinking about this is 
when I hear the comment that they're, uh, a, a person should be able to do what they want with their own property, well, if that's the case, they shouldn't have entered into a voluntary, into a CIC community, right? If they want to do what they want to do, no problem with that, but then don't go into a CIC. But if one has, and if a neighbor objects, and if these types of, of materials do result in discoloration, et cetera, who's going to pay for that? Is that going to be additional maintenance now that comes out of everybody in the community to have to periodically clean siding, repair siding, uh, power spray or, or wash somehow the, the shingles, and et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, Mr. Chair, I know that was a lot, but I'm just rectify some of the cleaning and, and others that might be a result. All right, thanks, Senator Lucero. So the question is about the implications of solar on rooftop and the cost that might be associated with that. Understanding that the bill relates to homeowners association's ability to contract, let me guess, Senator Coleman, you'd like Mr. O'Grady to tackle that? Mr. O'Grady. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Lucero, um, there was a lot of questions in there, so I'll try to get to each one. So in terms of materials and leaking, um, we do use sealant on our solar installations that help protect against any kind of leaking or, or anything. Discoloration, um, haven't seen that before, I guess. So um, it probably depends on the type of um, roof you have, and I'm, I'm not a roofer, so I can't answer that for you right now, um, but I can work on getting you an answer on that. Um, you also talked about entering voluntarily into these. A lot of times, uh, homeowners, people who purchase homes in homeowners associations do not receive the bylaws to their HOA until you have a purchase agreement that's been executed. So you're already far along in the line of buying a home, which is a stressful process. It's the biggest investment most people make. So most people aren't going to use the 10-day rescission period they're given in statute to walk away from that, that transaction. Um, and then to your question about um, who's responsible, uh, there's a couple of places in the bill. First in the amendment. Um, in the definition section on one point, line 1 1.4 of the amendment, it starts, and it says the person is wholly responsible for main, maintenance, repair, replacement, and insurance of the, of the building. So the person who owns the solar installation would, would be the one responsible for that whole building. Second of all, on, on line 2.26 of the bill, um, it also says that um, the owner of the system is responsible for um, among things, removing the system, but repair and maintenance of the system as well. Thank you, Mr. O'Grady. Senator Lucero, follow-up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And so uh, one quick follow-up question and then a comment. Could you repoint? I couldn't quite find, where would a homeowner who chooses to do this be responsible uh, for any maintenance that might be involved? And again, the discoloration I'm thinking about, and again, it may or may not be a reality, is... Uh, there are many instances where there's things that are installed on a roof or a building, basketball hoop, uh, any number of objects that over time, they create streaks as water is running down. It could be a rust streak. It could be any number of things. That's what I'm referring to when I'm thinking about streaks. Uh, so would a person in the bill be responsible for cleaning, maintenance, damage, et cetera, if that were to incur? Number two, the reference to CIC documents there is always the rescission period, as you just said, 10 days. And I guess as a real estate agent myself, I do know that that's a, a re, there is a, a component there where somebody may not want to rescind a purchase agreement, but that is always a possibility. If there are provisions in a CIC uh, bylaws that a person doesn't want to move forward with, a, with a, an executed purchase agreement, they certainly can do that. So that, uh, again, is not an excuse for me for somebody who voluntarily enters into these associations. If they don't want to do it, don't enter into the association. Find another home. People have that ability to do. So anyway, um, to the question about who's responsible for the cleanup. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Senator Lucero. Uh, members, our intention is to pass this bill out of this committee and send it to judiciary. So I'm uh, reminding members that there's an opportunity to talk about the contract and legal aspects in that fine committee run by the excellent Senator Ron Latz. But to the question, uh, Senator Coleman or Mr. O'Grady, if you wish to comment on the damages or remedy side of it, please do so. Mr. Chair, Senator Lucero, I think the question was where in the bill does it say that? And so on line 2.6, it starts addressing some of the restrictions and protections within this. Lines 2.26, it says the owner of the solar energy system is responsible for removing the system, repair, uh, maintenance, or replace of common elements. So I believe that would 
put the responsibility into the homeowner, uh, the homeowner's jurisdiction, I guess. Thank you, Mr. O'Grady. Senator Lucero, any follow-up? All right. Members, other questions related to the bill? Senator Mitchell, and keep it in mind, we have three other testifiers. Senator Mitchell. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question is to the amendment, which I, which I voted for as, you know, a nod, an author's amendment, but um, the bill as it stood, I was very happy with, and it was something I campaigned on. It's, it's an issue we have, and it, it's almost impossible to find new housing in Woodbury that doesn't have an HOIA, so just to say don't get one is kind of unrealistic. But one of the issues I specifically heard from someone is they'll allow solar panels but they're making you get like a certain color scheme that might be unrealistic. Um, so my concern to the amendment is it looks like if the HOA still had something that made it really hard to get a panel and something that was not necessarily a really realistic or affordable option for a solar panel, they could now, with the amendment, still disapprove this. Is that reading of this correct? Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Senator Coleman or Mr. O'Grady? Mr. Chair, Senator Mitchell, yes. Um, the amendment language reflects a couple of years of work with the Homeowners Association, Association um, and they still wanted to maintain some of the local jurisdiction over approving and disapproving within reasonable limits. So I think that's why we made that concession was to say that you have to approve or disapprove within a certain timeline and it still allows the homeowners association the authority to disapprove, so. Senator Mitchell. So, uh, w respectfully, what good does this do now with the amendment if the homeowners of uh, if the homeowners association can still say put in an, an arbitrary you know requirement that no one's going to be able to meet and then just disapprove them all Mr. O'Grady uh, Mr. Chair Senator Mitchell um, there are some certain restrictions on when you can and cannot approve within the bill. I think you can't raise the cost of the, the system $1,000. Um, there have to be reasonable restrictions, which is listed in there, which I know that reasonable is a term that I learned in law school, and I can manipulate that word if I want to. And so I think there might be some work that perhaps um, the author would still do. I know it has another stop to go. And I know that we are still working with the Homeowners Association as well and refining some of the language as well. So. Thank you, Mr. O'Grady. Senator Mitchell. I'm good. Okay. Members, Senator Grunhagen. I woke up finally. <laughs> no, thank you, Ms. Chair. Yeah, thank you, Senator Coleman. Yeah, okay, say it's denied by a homeowner's association. What's the option? I mean, if they say for this reason and they think it fits into the amendment and the bill, what is the person's option? Uh, I guess if uh, one of the testifiers would respond to that. Thank you, Senator Grunhagen. Uh, and members, we're on the bill as amended, so um, the, the A1 is on the bill. Senator Coleman, do you want to respond? Sure. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Grunhagen. A, a number of HOAs do have appeal processes uh, built into their bylaws that one could theoretically go through to appeal their decision. And my hope is with this bill in this version, with this amendment on it, we can get some feedback if there are any issues that come up after it's enacted and maybe tweak it a little bit. But right now we just wanna make sure that people have the option and that the door is being open for them uh, if they do live within an HOA and want to you know, try to be more eco-friendly. Thank you, Senator Coleman. Senator Grunhagen. All right. Members, we have three more testifiers. Any other questions before we move to the next testifier? Seeing none, um, Senator Coleman, you have with you, is it Mr. King? Yes, thank Mr. You. King, welcome to Mr. the committee. Please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Thank you, uh, Chairman Frantz. Uh, my name is Bobby King. I'm the Minnesota State Director for Solar United Neighbors. We're here to support the bill. Um, we work in Minnesota to help people go solar through, we do group purchasing. Um, group buys uh, that allows people to get a better price, find a trusted installer. We also use that group buy mechanism to help 
Some low-income people go solar as a part of that effort. We also do a lot of education one-on-one -on -one about solar. Uh, particularly right now, we've got to focus on the USDA Rural Energy for America program grants, which the uh, IDA increased from 25% of the cost of the project to 40% of the cost of the project. So for rural small businesses and farmers, it's a really uh, incredible opportunity, and we're trying to help uh, folks take advantage of that. But we also work on policy to make more solar possible, and uh, this bill would uh, definitely do that. Uh, one in four Minnesotans live in a HOA that's 37% of homeowners. And those, uh, they're often built in what used to be farm fields or uh, areas without a lot of trees. They've got large flat roofs, which make them ideal for solar. Often they're very large houses and they do have a high energy burden sometime. And um, the, the reason uh, I'm here working on this is we're, our work is driven by our supporters and I routinely get calls from HOA homeowners that wanted to go solar and were uh, either um, uh, told it would be a waste of time to apply or just their applications dismissed the day after it's submitted. And really the folks that contact me about this, they've they got uh, really three issues they're trying to deal with. Uh, one is they want to reduce their energy bill. And uh, I think there's a letter from a, a Coach Hill from Woodbury who would like to go solar. and. Um, to, to just do that, to decrease his energy bills, and he's actually worried about being able to stay in his home at the current energy, uh, current cost of energy they have. Um, but they want to reduce their energy costs. They also want to stabilize it. Once you put in the solar, you know what you're playing per kilowatt hour. So it allows people to budget and understand um, what it's going to look like to be in their home for the next 10, 20 years. And then a lot of folks are, of course, excited to be producing uh, renewable uh, power um, and contributing to our 100% clean energy standard that we've, we've passed. Uh, they want to bring their own private capital into that and they want to be a part of it. Um, so the concept of the bill I think is simple and uh, uh, we support it as amended and, and would even uh, uh, appreciate if it went farther, but if it's your home and the roof over your home is, and you own it, and the roof over your home covers only your home, um, then you should be able to go solar in a way that doesn't impose any additional costs on the HOA or other uh, HOA homeowners. And I know there's, from some HOA homeowners, there can be anxiety about this, and I think what folks are imagining is the solar of, you know, the 1980s, where it was, you know, propped up at an angle, wasn't flush with the roof, but I wish I'd brought some pictures. Modern solar arrays are, they're very nice looking. They blend in with the roof, they go at the angle of the roof, they don't jut over, cables are hidden. Um, often um, you wouldn't know it unless you were looking for it, and they're certainly less obtrusive to the eye than things like telephone poles, telephone wires, or, or satellite dishes. So we hope that Minnesota can become one of the, the 28th state to adopt a provision like this, and I know that if we do, we'll see a lot more solar business and a lot more solar homeowners in the very near future. Uh, just one comment about the um, question about the denial. Um, the way I understand the bill, uh, lines 2.29 to 3.5, um, they can't just uh, outright deny uh, for no reason. And they can put restrictions on the, they can impose some restrictions, but those restrictions can't decrease the solar's production by more than 10% or increase the cost by more than, I think it's a thousand bucks. So they could impose things like you need to have panels that match your shingles as best as possible. Thank, thank you for authoring the bill and thank you committee for hearing my testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. King. Uh, members, any questions for this testifier? Seeing none, we're gonna move on to the next witness. Um, Senator Coleman, I have a Carl Severson on the list. Is that right? Mr. Severson, if you're here, please come forward. Chair and friends, I had made copies of my testimony for the, yourself and the committee members, if that's uh, allowable. That's fine. We can have the pages hand those out, Mr. Severson. Mr. Severson, welcome to the committee. If you could start, please, by introducing yourself and then please present your testimony. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Carl Severson. I reside in Chaska, Minnesota, 
in a town home in a multi-dwelling building at the Hidden Creek Homeowners Association, HCHA. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity uh, to come before the committee and provide testimony in support of uh, Senator File 1009-3. Uh, I'm a retired commander, United States Navy Civil Engineer Corps. I'm a retired professional engineer in the states of California and Iowa. Over my 53-year career, uh, I've held positions as an operating engineer, naval officer, state and federal civilian employee, energy manager, consultant, consulting engineer. I've held certifications as a certified energy manager and a consulting engineer and a uh, certified plant engineer, uh, as well as other energy-related certifications. I've performed or reviewed uh, hundreds of energy uh, efficiency analyses uh, using either simple playback or life cycle cost methodologies. Uh, my wife and I purchased our town home at HCHA in 2018. Over the last four plus years, I've analyzed and invested approximately 25 energy efficiency improvements in eight separate energy conservation categories for our home. Uh, for each improvement project, I performed an engineering economic analysis to determine the value of that project, those projects. Uh, the HCHA had no objections to those home improvements, some of which involved penetration of or attachment to the building exterior surfaces. Each month during the heating season, I typically receive communications from uh, Centerpoint Energy, our natural gas service provider, uh, that our home exceeds by one to three percent lower energy consumption than efficient homes in comparable size in the service area. Um, my wife often comments that we don't have a home, we've got an engineering laboratory and a testing facility. Uh, having passed familiarity with solar photovoltaic systems, efficiency, reliability, and aesthetics, I researched the current technologies for those features. I determined I could replace 98% of my annual electric consumption provided by the city of Chasco with a soda full of Gataic array mounted to our roof. Today's systems are sold and installed with a 25-year warranty on parts and labor. Uh, the current useful life of today's solar panels is estimated to be 50 to 60 years. The engineering economic analysis used the 25-year warranty for the life cycle cost analysis. The analysis resulted in a net annual return of investment of 8% per year. Federal tax credits and city energy rebates were available for the project. Uh, the estimated reduction in conventionally produced electricity was over 12,000 kilowatt hours per year. The roof is owned and maintained by the HCHA. I submitted the required package to the HCHA board for review. At that time, I held the position of director at large on that uh, HOA. Uh, the board president solicited comments from association home members. I was advised the matter would be discussed once all board members were back on board at the site. I received notification from the board president that the project was unanimously disapproved by the board. As a board member, I was denied an opportunity to address the issues presented to the board by the association home members or any questions that the board members themselves might have. I was told by the board president that I was excluded from the board discussions due to a conflict of interest. I was denied an opportunity uh, to defend the project. Many of the concerns that were brought to the HCHA by association homeowners were due to misconceptions about how modern solar panels work. Uh, responses uh, to those comments are provided below. Roof maintenance. As the system owner, I would pay for removal and installation of the solar panels in the event of repair, replacement, or roofing, of the roofing system. All potential installers uh, provided five-year no-leak guarantee on panel installation sites. The top two-tier uh, potential employers, installers have been in business for 11 and four years respectively, with no claims of installation roof leak issues. Estimated removal and reinstallation. Mr. Uh, Saverson, yes, sorry, sir. sorry to interrupt. We, we try to keep the testimony to two, three minutes, so uh, we have your written material. Just reminding you, we're keep, go ahead. Just wanted to uh, keep the thing moving. That's okay. my job up here. Um, okay, it, I've got the responses in that next section as to what the uh, objections were and what my responses would have been. 
um, recommended amendments of the bill. Um, Subdivision, subdivision two applicability. I've highlighted the uh, language changes that I, I would think would be helpful. Uh, the section applies to single or multiple dwelling family dwellings uh, where the dwelling owner owns or has a right. And I crossed that exclusive and changed that to primary use of the roof. Uh, citing multiple uh, dwellings covers my home in a five dwelling unit building in which my home is included. Exclusive use of the roof would result in my solar project being HOA rejected since the HOA, in addition to having access for inspection, repair, replacement. Uh, in contrast to that, I'm using the roof seven days a week and 365 days a year. So I've got primary use of that roof. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on uh, this important legislation. Uh, I hope to see something passed that would, with recommended language changes uh, this year so that I can have a solar system on my home in the near future. So I welcome the opportunity for any questions. Oh, I do have a, a comment with regarding to the issues of panels being installed and what their effects are. Briefly. Uh, the system that I was looking at uh, were mounted on aluminum frames which allow the two inch gap between the uh, panels and the, and the walls. Uh, the operating temperatures during the winter are about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. During the summer, it's 105. During the summer, the temperature is a lot higher. They're actually, the panels are protecting the roof and allows for natural ventilation and drying to prevent any kind of mold development. Thank you, Mr. Cyrus, and thank you also for your service. And thank you for being the first testifier in this committee this session who recommended his own amendments and actually <laughs> used the right uh, language. Members, any questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you again, Mr. Cyberson. And then I believe we have Mr. Hines listed as the final witness, Senator. Mr. Hines, if you'll come forward, please. If we could create some room for Mr. Hines, that would expedite his testimony. Mr. Hines, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Good afternoon. My name is Patrick Hines with Messer Lee Kramer. I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota chapter of the Community Associations Institute. CIA is a trade organization that represents the interests of homeowner associations, including their residents, volunteer board members, management companies, and, and those who help HOAs do their work. Um, I'd like to thank Senator Coleman, even though we haven't had a chance to chat yet. Um, this amendment, the A-1, and a great deal of the bill as introduced were the result of negotiations back in 2020 or in 2021, and for various reasons the bill didn't get over the finish line. I'm appreciative that she honored the work that uh, other stakeholders did in the past in bringing forward this amendment. Um, Typically, CAI is not a fan of bills that restrict the ability of homeowner associations to impose reasonable restrictions and to uh, govern themselves. They are um, volunteer nonprofit corporation boards, and um, they do have a great deal of rights and responsibilities to manage their properties. However, if the legislature identifies a public policy that it feels is important, um, we can be generally uh, supportive if the restrictions that are imposed are reasonable and we think that um, for the most part these are. I think to Senator um, Lucero's question and, and actually I think uh, Mr. King summarized it quite nicely is the way the bill's drafted. The biggest concern a homeowner association has is that if someone does something to their unit that it impose costs and liability onto the association. And if you have costs imposed on the association, the only way to pay for that is to have the members of the association pay. So by limiting this um, with the A1 amendment lines 1.4 to 1.6, to single family detached dwellings where you have a single owner who's responsible for the repair, for the maintenance, um, that really takes the risk of, and liability away from the other homeowners. Um, I would say I don't believe that this amendment in response to Senator Mitchell's question changes anything about what restrictions an association can place uh, on an application for solar panels. Those, that, that language starts on 
line 2.11 of the bill. And essentially the bill presumes if you have a single family home that it will be approved. And it does allow very minimal um, requirements to be placed on it. And a reasonable restriction, as Mr. O'Grady mentioned, can't increase the cost by over 20%. And I don't think it would be a reasonable restriction if a homeowner association tried to require something that wasn't readily available in the marketplace. So um, the only, only last comment I'll make is some of the language was not what we uh, had worked out last year, but we're still in the process of doing it. That appears on line 1.7 and 1.9 of the A1 amendment. It's just simply the issue of what happens if you have uh, two duplexes, a duplex, for instance, where the roof is shared. Our concern is that, and, and I think Mr. Syverson, um, his situation wouldn't be dealt with by this bill because he shares a roof with multiple owners. And in that case, you would have multiple parties potentially having responsibility for the decision of one, and that's not something we support. But um, I hope that is brief enough and gets us where we're going. Thank you. It is, and thank you, Mr. Hines. Members, questions for Mr. Hines? Again, our intention is to pass this bill out of committee and send it to judiciary. All right, seeing none. Up, oh, sorry, Senator Rarick. Uh, Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I, Senator Coleman, I appreciate the bill. Um, there are times I wish uh, it would maybe even go a little further. I think we've heard many stories of folks who want to fly a flag in their front yard or something, and there are multiple restrictions. And I, I think. Uh, without getting, I sometimes hate seeing these bills that come forward addressing one specific item. You know, this is basically addressing solar when there are a number of other things that could be addressed to say that these are common sense things that a, an individual should be able to do on their, their place. So I, I do support this. I, I wish it would maybe even go a little bit further. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Rarick. Senator Coleman, I don't suppose that solar installation is your only interest in homeowners associations? <laughs> no comment, Mr. Chair. <laughs> All right. With that, uh, members, any other questions for the author to the bill as amended? Um, Senator Coleman, any final thoughts? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I greatly appreciate the time before the committee today and for all the testifiers. Uh, a brief comment, you know, having had lived uh, in a homeowners association, uh, and you do enter into it freely, uh, a little bit about my experience with the process is a little piece of paper gets put in your door, sometimes it gets rained on or it gets falls and blows away like our campaign lit used to, and uh, you, you realize you missed a meeting and the, the rules that you agreed to change pretty quickly. And so sometimes HOAs do need to, to work with the legislature on some reasonable uh, fixes, and I do believe this bill is one of them. Uh, you know, we had a lot of great testimony, and I think if you see a bill where it goes a little too far for one side and not far enough for the other, it's probably some common sense legislation you should look into. So I appreciate the time. We're going to work a little bit more on this as it makes its way to ju judiciary and, and would appreciate the support to get it there. Thank you very much, Senator. With that, Senator Hoffman moves that um, Senate file 1003 as amended be recommended to pass and sent to the Senate Committee on Judiciary. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, say nay. With that, the bill as amended is referred to judiciary to pass. Thank you very much, Senator Coleman. Thanks. Members, that's the end of our agenda. We are adjourned. <laughs>